Good morning. It is so good to hear all your voices and see your faces. Welcome to worship here at Forest Hill. If it's your first, let's try this again, like in camp. Good morning. Good morning. Need to do the like. Hey, I think we got one. All right. Welcome to Forest Hill. We're so glad that you are with us and joyful this morning in worship. Uh, in this day, you get me for preaching, so sorry about that. But uh, we want you to remember uh, to continue to lift up Mandy in your prayers. She's on renewal leave for the next four weeks. So if you need anything, um, reach out to the office, and they can connect you with the person that can best help you in the weeks to come. So we continue to remember her uh, in our prayers. This coming Tuesday, we have Painting with Peggy. It's exciting. The nighttime class is full. So if you are interested, 10 a.m. on Tuesday, there are, I think there are about eight slots left. You can find that on the email. You can see um, Wes or myself, and we will get you signed up this morning um, for that. It's a really fun time. You don't have to be an artist. You can be. You just make the rest of us look bad. But you don't have to be an artist if you want to come to it. We are doing our back to school supply drive. So every year we collect certain supplies that the teachers at um, Concord Middle School need for their classrooms. So it's a little different than supplies going to students. They go into the hands of the teachers who know what their needs are for their students. And so we're collecting four items. You can bring them all at once. You can bring them each item a week. Uh, that is all up to you. Um, but it's like Kleenexes, the marble composition notebooks, Expo markers, and wooden number two pencils. Last year we gave them like 4,000 pencils and we said, are you sure you don't want something different? And they said, no, we can always use pencils. So any of those items, feel free to bring those in. We're going to collect them for the next four weeks uh, during worship or you can drop them off in the office. This fall, we are starting uh, one of our Bible studies, and this is Disciple 2. We talked about it last week. If you'd like some more information, you can see Pastor Wes. You don't have to have done Disciple 1 to be a part of Disciple 2. Uh, it's not like a do one, check it off, prerequisite kind of thing. Uh, and then finally, we are having a back-to-school bash on August the 13th. It's also a day that we're going to do Promotion Sunday for Sunday School, which means all of the students, if they have moved up a grade or they're going into like high school or middle school, they'll kind of transition uh, into different classes. And so we're excited for that. If you want any information on how you can help out with that, you can see Amanda for the back-to-school bash. Uh, and that will be on the afternoon of the 13th. So with all of these things, I invite you to stand and join me in prayer. God, we give you thanks for your presence in our lives. We give you thanks for the ways that you work and move, the ways that we experience your goodness. And we pray for the ways that we can share that in all that we do and that it will spring forth so that others will see your goodness and your love and your grace uh, in their own world. All these things we ask and pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Since you're already standing, let us join and sing. I'm not.
we thank you so much for your love and your grace as we gather in this place to worship, to praise you, to center our hearts and our lives on you and all that is good. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.
You may be seated. We have several names on the prayer list this morning. Uh, Glenda Long is still and recovering from her shoulder surgery. Uh, Laurel Ramirez, uh, Lapita's husband, had surgery on Friday on his arm and had pins placed in three places, and he's going to be in a cast uh, for who knows and go through four months of uh, recovery. But he did well. He drank coffee with cream and sugar early in the morning, so they had to wait five extra hours before they could take him to surgery. So, uh, But he did well. Uh, Lapita had a long, long day, though. Uh, uh, we remember Megan as she continues to improve, and Susan Plyler and Michelle, who's here and improving, and we're glad for that. Austin Burridge, Bryce's sister, Kathy, uh, who gets married this week uh, and then has a major surgery in two weeks. Uh, we're remembering Jim Thurman and uh, Ken and Diane Wilson. Ken had a stroke several weeks ago, and but he's home and going through therapy, but doing pretty well. Uh, Diane is in Morningside in the memory unit uh, now, and uh, so we remember them as they go through these transitions. Uh, and of course, we remember Mandy on her uh, leave and. Uh, as she's finding rest and peace. Let us bow our heads now and be in prayer. O oh God, in the middle of the chaos of life, we gather to sing praise, to give thanks for your goodness, to pause and remember that we are not the center of the universe to seek moments of peace in all the changes that life brings. Thank you for loving this world. Thank you for loving us. We are surrounded by harsh words and anger, by meanness and selfishness, by a callousness about life. We live surrounded by fear and we find it easy to be afraid. We are told to fear a particular political party, to fear immigrants on the border, to be afraid of those who are different, to shy away from change. The arguments about climate change, about guns, about abortion, about being woke, about so many different issues stir deep emotions within us. Help us to hear the word you shared with Abraham, the word which Gabriel said to Mary, which the angels sang to the shepherds, which the angels told the women who came to the tomb on Easter, be not afraid, be not afraid. Help us to trust you with our lives. Surround us with your love and forgiveness. Enable us to live our faith every day, everywhere we are. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? We stand amazed before the risen Jesus, and we ask him to be at work in the lives of these folks whom we love. Bless Glenda and L'Oreal and Megan and Susan as they recover from surgeries and sickness. Bless Michelle with your energy and healing. Watch over Austin. Bless Bryce's sister, Kathy. Be with Jim. Surround Ken and Diane in these new steps in their journey in life, 
Fill them with your peace. Bless Mandy with a deep sense of your presence. And let her breathe in air that brings rest and peace to her heart and soul. We love you, O oh God. Hear our prayers spoken and silent. We make them in Jesus' name, praying as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I practice without my shoes on, so I forgot to switch my microphone here. During the summer of my sophomore year, I had an opportunity to go live and work in Washington, D.C. It looked like the best summer of my life was coming. My dad was not too excited about it because he had traveled frequently to the city and knew a little bit more about it than I did. For example, this was in the 1980s when Washington, D.C. had decided the best way to solve their budget shortage was to release the nonviolent mental patients from the local institutions. So during my first week waiting for the, uh, the bus with the other commuters, I was standing there, and all of a sudden all the other commuters stepped back away from me. And I looked around, <laughs> and up came this somewhat frightening-looking unhoused person, and he began to dig into the trash can next to me, to look for something to eat or drink. I stayed rooted in the spot, and I was shocked and stunned and stricken. So when I got to the office, I called my father, and I poured out my heart. And he soothed me, and I resolved to do better next time because I was really ashamed that I could not help this person. Well, that opportunity came the very next week. There I was sitting outside the McDonald's at the subway station, and up came a disheveled man and sat about two seats next to me. And I decided I was going to buy him breakfast. I waited till he looked at me. Oh, making eye contact with homeless people is not a good way to go in the city. But when he did look at me, he lunged at me and he barked. Well, I was terrified and backed up. And again, felt ashamed for my helplessness in that way. After these experiences, I did everything I could. I would give money to my church. I would give to homeless shelters, charities, food banks, etc. It was too overwhelming to deal directly with the unhoused for me. Fast forward to 2017, I get another opportunity. I'm a grown woman now. I'm in Portland, uh, Portland, Oregon with my very best friend. And into this chocolate shop walks this young man in an oversized suit, wild hair, and mismatched shoes covered in paint. And he looked really uncomfortable when he saw us there. Well, I decided I was going to try and make him feel more at ease, and then I was going to offer to buy him a coffee or something. And I wanted to start with an easy conversation, so looking at his shoes, I said, excuse me, are you an artist? He looked at me, excuse me, and I said, well, my daughter's an artist. She has shoes like you. I see you've been painting. Are you an artist? And he said, sort of. I'm more of a musician. And... I realized he had a little British accent, so I probably just insulted a fellow tourist. And I thought, oh, God. But my friend came to my rescue, and she said, oh, you're a musician. Are you playing somewhere in town? Maybe we can come see you. At that point, the young man dipped into his oversized jacket pocket and pulled out a 20 and sort of looked at it and dropped it on the counter and ordered a chocolate. 
And he looked at us and he said, yes, playing at the Coliseum. Oh, my God. I had been about to buy a coffee for international rock star Maddie Healy. You may know him as Taylor Swift's latest ex. <laughs> but when I think about this story, it's a gentle reminder that it isn't my place to judge, but to seek to help people no matter who they are, no matter where they are, and to give them comfort and support. And we do this as a church when we give our tithes and offerings. We reach the community in many different ways. Here at Forest Hill, we have the clothing closet, positive provisions, Tuesday night community meal, etc. And these ministries reach out to our community without pretense, and they're rooted in God's perfect compassion and love for all of God's people, whether we know them or not. So may we collectively give to the glory of God. And it's time to join me in singing. <laughs> I'm glad the band decided to come up. <laughs> <We're lucky. laughs>
great are you, Lord. Maybe seated. it. So today's scripture comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 through 25, and it says this. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also be guided by the Spirit. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So at this point, you have probably heard of lively conversations that have happened between the staff, in particular between Wes and anyone else on staff, where he likes to have fun conversations about things like theology and existential questions about life and the world. Uh, And though I will say, Wes has a really good way of walking into one of our offices. He'll say, isn't that interesting? And then he'll just wait for one of us to bite. (laughs) You might say he's a little bit of an instigator in this way. He knows what gets us fired up. It's because we always take the bait. Every time. We always take the bait. And before you know it, you're having some conversation that's like an hour long about this thing that you didn't know that you cared about so much, and you can't stop thinking about it as you move on with your day. Well, I have this friend who uh, is in town, and she's going to seminary now. And so I get to, first of all, revel that she has to read and write papers and go to classes, and I don't anymore. Uh, But I also get to have those kinds of fun conversations uh, with her. And earlier this summer, uh, we got to talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We agreed on a lot of things in the Scripture, but there are a couple things that we kind of sort of maybe didn't quite agree on at all. Um, But after talking, I thought it was a lot like my conversation that I've had and others have had with Wes, where before you know it, you, you found this passion for this thing that you didn't know, and now you're down a rabbit hole digging into it and unpacking it in ways that you never had considered before. And so the questions that I had were, what does it mean to bear fruit? What does bearing fruit this fruit of the Spirit, have on us? What does it do to us as Christians and as the church? And finally, what are the connections between the Spirit, our lives, 
our faith journey, and these things that we call fruit. And so the idea of bearing fruit, it's not something that's uncommon in our scripture. Uh, The imagery would have been familiar to anyone that was living at the time of the early church. Proverbs talks about how the righteous bear fruit. And Jeremiah talks about those who trust in the Lord uh, are like trees planted by water that never cease to bear fruit. And then in the Gospels, Jesus talks about people and how you may know them by the good or the bad fruit that they bear. And then in the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about abiding in him and the love of God. And he says that those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. So the scripture, it develops this idea, this idea that fruit is the byproduct of the thing from which it comes. The fruit is imbued with the qualities of the things that nourish it, the things that give it life. So thinking back to that original conversation that I had had with my friend and our disagreement, it kind of came from the place of talking about what the purpose of the fruit was. And I found myself in that moment really leaning into my like Wesleyan Methodist roots. You know, sometimes conversations like this, they kind of push us and they nudge us and they guide us to a place where our thoughts, our beliefs are kind of clarified in those moments. And so for my friend, the fruit was seen as this prescriptive thing, like a prescription. So a set of instructions, this way to live, um, like a one a day, do love, do joy, do peace. Uh, and you do all these things and you will become a healthy Christian. A kind of like a to-do list. Uh, do X, Y, Z, you'll be a good Christian. Uh, the prescriptive way, though, it didn't quite get me all the way there. It didn't quite cut it for me. Do any of you write to-do lists? Do any of you finish your to-do list? I never do. If you do, I have some items that you can take off of my to-do list. Uh, For me, I just keep adding and adding and adding and adding things to my list, and it feels impossible for me to get through my list sometimes. I start to feel a little defeated. I feel like my energy is gone before I've even gotten to starting. And sometimes I get distracted by things that are also important. They're just not on my list. Sometimes I realize I've been in a conversation for an hour with Wes, and now I'm on my computer Googling these things. And then I realize I have a to-do list. What am I doing in this moment? But this new thing is so exciting and interesting that I want to devote time to it, and then I have to figure out a way to balance all of that. So this to-do list idea, the way it looms over me, it's really hard for me to figure out how to incorporate these new things that come up or that spring up. And so for me, this is kind of what happens when we approach the fruit of the Spirit as this to-do list of sorts, these objectives that we have to accomplish. It doesn't just get to the heart of it for me. Yes, I'm I'm not saying as Christians that we're not supposed to do things that are filled with love or joy or peace. Uh, And yes, we do love God and we do love our neighbor. And we do that by living a life filled with all of these fruit. But for me, I think the fruit of the Spirit, they're descriptive. They're not prescriptive, but they're descriptive. They describe these wonderful expressions of our relationship with God and they come to life in our life and in the world. So the work of the Holy Spirit in these things, they stir within us these characteristics of the God who loves us, who fills us with peace, who empowers us to go into the world, and empowers us to live a life shaped by the one who created us, and all the while sharing these things with those around us. So as we advance in this like holiness of life, with the work of the Spirit and the grace of God, we begin to closer reflect God in our own life. Our lives become reflections of who we are as followers of Christ. And because of this, we just can't help these things. We just can't help but have our spirit bear witness to God's love and the pervasive grace of God in our life in these ways that just pop up. So love just pops up. It springs forth peace and patience and kindness and generosity and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So for me, 
the fruit of the Spirit for us as Christians, there are these things that come forth and they point us back towards God. The abundant life that we've experienced through Christ calls us forward to live lives that are reflective of this love that we have experienced. Christ's call to love God and love our neighbor, it bubbles up in our lives the more that we grow in grace. And John Wesley, who said, um, he said that those who love God rejoice with a humble heart and a holy delight and an obedient love. As followers of Christ, we're no longer bound by these like self-centered powers of sin in our life. And instead, God's love is poured out in ways that our heart becomes focused on God. And it draws us into connectional relationships in the world. In another sermon, uh, Wesley said that the fruit of the Spirit formed this empirical, like a scientific proof of the way that our lives have been transformed by God. He said those that have the fruit of the Spirit love God and their neighbor, and they live in uniform practice of justice and mercy and truth, and do good to all people, live lives of happiness and ease, and they have found their voice to witness. So in January, we introduced our theme of the year, Embody. Earlier, Greg came up and he said, do you know that this is the slide from the beginning of the year? And that's on purpose. So for the next couple weeks, we're kind of, kind of remembering this theme that has carried us through so far. And earlier in the year, we talked about the ways that we embody the gospel. The ways that this theme is not just for us individually, but it's for us as a church, as a collective. And so the church too, this body of Christ in the world, it's also empowered by the Holy Spirit. We know this because like in baptism, we acknowledge the work of the Spirit as those are incorporated into the body. And through communion, we gather not only to remember the work of Christ, but to be nourished, to be empowered, to then go into the world to share that love and grace of God with all those that we meet. So the church, we hope, the church can be the people that embodies good fruit. They can be the ones that embody the good fruit born out of this work of the Holy Spirit. So when we packed uh, bags a couple weeks ago for prison ministry, this is one of the ways that we embodied the fruit of the Spirit. We may not even thought that that's what we were doing at the time, but we were claiming God's love and God's grace. And we say that that extends to all people. And we want them to know that even though they're in this difficult place in their life, that they have value and that they have worth. And sharing this love with them in this small way, it's not a conditional love. Rather, it's born out of the unconditional love that we've experienced from God. And we want to share that with others. So we're saying that we love you. We care for you. And we know that this moment is difficult, but there are people who haven't forgotten you in this place. What about peace? So the other day, I was talking with somebody, and they said that it was really good that they could come to church with their whole family. And it was one of the first times that they felt that way in a church. It was a place where they could just be, and they could just worship. And they could experience the peace of God in those moments. And they could experience it with the people around them that they love. Think about patience. Patience can be this cooperative thing that we do as a church. When we share in life together and we start to grow in empathy and we start to learn about people and we care about them and we start to see them as children of God, it gives us this patience that we understand that not only are they children of God, but we are also children of God and we can extend grace to others just as God has extended grace. And even those that we have little patience for. In those moments, we can find the love and grace of God and share it with those. And that's really beautiful. That's when like deepening relationships happen and then they come forth in our lives. So the last four weeks, we've all on the staff had to also have patience as we have gone through summer camp. And so it's been really fun, but the staff has kind of done some things in the last couple weeks. And we've stepped up uh, and been in the classroom or helped out and they needed to. And everybody was tired. The staff was tired. The students and the kids that were here, they were really tired. It was hot. They were here for long days. And like all of us, sometimes the kids can get cranky. 
just a little bit. So he had this one student, and she was just tired, and she was upset, and she was crying and yelling, and she was not happy. And so a couple people tried to go and, and calm her down and kind of sit in that moment, but it just wasn't working. And then one of our uh, preschool teachers who was here at summer camp, Christina, came into the room. And she came, and she, like, sat down beside this student, and she said, do you want a hug? And the kid who was not happy said, yes. <laughs> and they just hugged. And she calmed down, and she was able to breathe. So in that little moment, that's one of the ways that we reach out in gentleness and kindness. And we're embodying that kindness and gentleness that we, too, have experienced from God. What about Generosity. As we've experienced the extravagant love of God, we can't help but be generous and share that love of God with those in our world. So the other week, uh, somebody came into the office, and they had these two big boxes of tie-dye T-shirts. And they set them down, and they said, I saw these shirts, and I just thought I should buy them and give them to the church. I don't know what you're going to do with them, but I thought it would be really good. And so we sat there, and we thought, what can we do with these? And so in a little bit of time, we had made up the designs for the shirts, and we sent them off to a screen printer who printed them and then brought them back. And then we were able to sell tie-dye shirts, which if you don't know, they're kind of an expensive thing, um, for a really low price. And these shirts, they have the message on the back that says, God's love is inclusive. So because of this one person's generosity, we as a church have been able to share and come together in this way of being generous in the world. And so through this one person and then through us as a church, people are wearing these shirts in the world. And I've heard about people who come up and they're like secretly taking a picture behind people as they're wearing it. Or they'll come up and say, where are you from? What is this shirt all about? And then one person even said, you know, I told myself that I didn't really think there was a place in a church, but then I see your shirt. And I think that maybe that's not true, and I've been telling myself something that isn't true. Generosity enables enables us as the church to share God's message and empowers us to reach out and witness. And our faithfulness. Our witness is our way that we share our faithfulness and the faithfulness of God. So when we embody the gospel in our daily life and all the things that we do, we are living into our trust of God through Jesus the last one, self-control. I think kind of Paul probably saved this one for last. Um, like Mandy said last week, living in community and this communal way of the church as the body of Christ, it can be hard sometimes. Self-control requires that we take a step back from ourselves and recognize that as much as we may want it to be, not everything is always about what we want. It's not always about us. And it's about tempering that me-centered kind of mindset that we can fall into. So in a way, self-control is what happens when we shift our focus from ourself to our focus on God and our love of God and others. It's when we step out of the way and we allow the Holy Spirit to be in the work in our midst. Then these fruit, they just, they just come forth from our living the overwhelming pressure to check off boxes of being absolutely perfect. It's replaced with this deep relationship with God. So our heart becomes fixed on God and it's shaped by the love of God and guided by the Spirit. Life, life isn't necessarily easy all the time. And it's not necessarily something that there's a prescription that we'll, we can just take or do. No matter how easy that would be, but when we let go... And when we let God in, it's really exciting to see what fruit God is nurturing. I think that's the good news in this, that God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness is always with us. It's always working in our life, calling us forward, challenging us to be better, forgiving us when we fall short, and transforming these everyday things into opportunities to witness to the goodness of God through the fruit that we bear. John Wesley asked, Is God the center of your soul, the sum of all of your desires? Is your eye single in all things, 
always fixed on him, always looking unto Jesus. Do you point at him in whatever you do, in all your labor, in your business, your conversation, aiming only at the glory of God in all? May God be the center and of our soul, and may we bear fruit nourished by the love of God and the peace of Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the ways that we have encountered your love and your grace, for the ways that you continue to work in our life through your Spirit. God, open our hearts to be transformed by your reconciling love in all we say and do. May we keep you at the center. May our lives bear fruit, markers of you in our life. And may we, as your people, go out into the world bearing witness to you. God, we thank you for the love and joy, peace and patience, kindness, and generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that we find in you. We pray all these things in the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand and join in singing.